Welcome to Raving Ryan. I'm your host, Ryan Anastasio. Today, I have a very special guest, the Chief Justice of the Connecticut Supreme Court, Richard Robinson. Mr. Chief Justice, how are you? Thanks for coming on. I'm very well. Thanks for having me. Yeah, it's great to have you here. Uh, you grew up in Stanford, Connecticut, and then attended UConn in West Virginia Law School. Can you, tell, can you tell us a little bit about your early life and what it was like growing up in Connecticut at the time? Yeah. I grew up in, in Stanford on the west side. Um, my family was uh, what I would describe as lower middle class. Um, I went to a school, uh, the public school system, um, Stephen Elementary School, Turner River Junior High School, West Hill High School. Pretty normal upbringing. Two brothers. I was the middle child, and so therefore very competitive and always right. Yeah, and after law school, you um, worked as a lawyer for the city of Stanford until you appointed as a superior court judge in 2000. And what inspired you to apply to be a judge, and what was it, what was it like when you first got the appointment? Actually, I, I didn't think about becoming a judge. It's sort of an interesting story. I was an attorney for the city of Stanford, and I was doing a lot of volunteer work on various commissions and things like that. And the governor's legal counsel approached me, Governor Rowland's legal counsel approached me and asked me would I be interested in being a judge. And I didn't know what to say. It was like, uh, I never thought about it. I can't tell, you know, I can't tell them that. And so I said, yeah, of course I'm interested in becoming a judge. Yeah. And I didn't do it. I didn't fill out the paperwork. And so he approached me himself the second time and said, hey, you know, do you want to be a judge? And I said, of course. And I was busy with trial and I didn't do it again. And finally, he approached me the third time and said uh, he was serious and w would I be interested. And I said yes. He told me to get my paperwork in, and I did, and uh, I became a judge. And what was the change like from being a lawyer to then going on to the bench as a judge? It was kind of tough. Um, and the reason why is because I was a, a defense attorney, a litigator. And when you're a litigator, you really have to worry about just one side, your client side. And so, you know, you're doing everything to zealously represent your client. The biggest change from litigator to judge is that you become the neutral person in the room. You know, the judge doesn't fight for either side, and we have a, you know, a advocacy system. And so the whole thing is you have two sides arguing a case and the judge or the jury deciding it. Um, to go from arguing and zealously representing your client to being the neutral person can be kind of tough, and it was a bit of a tough transition for me, I think. And you served on the Superior Court for seven years. What was that court like, and what kind of cases did you hear there? Um, I started out as a, uh, a criminal court judge in a GA, that's a geographical area, um, and I loved it. I was afraid to do it at first, didn't think I'd be able to do it. I had really never done criminal work before. Um, but uh, every judge is required to go through what we call judges school, and judges are trained to do certain things. We then go and we sit with another judge in the beginning of the assignment, and we learn the assignment better. Um, then you're out on your own. But the, one of the m remarkable things about being a judge is there's always somebody else there to help you. Judges are so good at helping each other out and, and teaching each other about their various roles in the court. And so it was a lot of fun. Um, I thoroughly enjoyed being a, a trial judge. Um, after the two years of criminal, I then went to the civil court um, and eventually became what's called a PJ, a presiding judge. And uh, the presiding judge is sort of like... Um, the director of the band. Uh, you have a presiding judge for civil, presiding judge for family, presiding judge uh, for criminal. And so I would assign judges assignments in the civil side and uh, do trials and things like that. Yeah, and especially on the criminal side, a judge has a big responsibility in that case. And it's really deciding the fate of someone's uh, life. It could uh, be many years that they have to spend in jail. And many th we've seen many times in society where judges sometimes uh, give harsher sentences and some judges that give lighter sentences. Did you witness any of that when you were um, there at the Superior Court? Well, you know, each judge sentencing style can be different, um, but we have to be consistent. And so if you have a situation where a, a sentence is radically different from others, there's actually a mechanism to fix that. Um, it's reviewed by a panel of judges to determine whether that sentence is an appropriate sentence for that particular case. And so that mechanism stops it from being uh, arbitrary. Uh, so there's, uh, you know, the, the work we do is important, but the checks and balances we have on ourselves are equally important. Yeah, and then in 2007, you were appointed to the Connecticut Appellate Court. Um, what was that court like, and was it different, much different than the Superior Court? Yes. Um, the, the difficulty in that transition is you go from being this one independent judicial officer to being uh, with a group. The Appellate Court sits in a panel of three. And so uh, you hear cases in the morning or cases in the afternoon. 
But then after the case is over, you have to decide the case. And you have to sit there and you talk with the other two judges that are on the case, and you try to build a consensus. Sometimes you get three saying the same thing. Sometimes you don't. Sometimes you end up with one dissent. Uh, I have actually was on one panel where there was one dissent and one concurring. So you had three different opinions from three different judges in one case. Um, and that was sort of fascinating. It was, a di was it a difficult, difficult transition for you to be the, be the one person then working on a panel of three? It was. It was. Because you, you get very independent. And I don't have to build a consensus if it's just me. Yeah. But when you're working with two other people, you have to sit there and think about things and strategize. Well, what if he doesn't agree or she doesn't agree with me on my point A and point B? Can I get them to move to that position? So you sit there and you talk and about what's the good parts of your argument, what's the bad parts of your argument, and you work until you can get as much agreement as you possibly can out of that particular case, and you decide that and you move on to the next case. Yeah, and then, and then in 2013, Governor Malloy nominated you to be an Associate Justice for this uh, Connecticut Supreme Court. Um, this is the highest court in the state, and very few people um, become justices on this court. What was your reaction when the governor offered you the job, and what was the confirmation process like for you? Um, I could not believe that he did it. Uh, we, you know that the governor is looking for a replacement, and, and you might get that call to go over and talk to him. But to actually receive the call and say it's you, um, I remember sort of hesitating um, when he made the call. Um, I've known the governor for quite a while, uh, actually, when he was the mayor of the city of Stanford. And even before that, when he was a board member of the city of Stanford. And we went to the same high school, so I actually remember seeing him there. Um, but to receive that call is, it's almost mind-boggling. Um, and this poor kid from the West Side, I never thought that I'd, I'd become a judge, let alone a Supreme Court justice. Um, so it's, yeah, it's just wow. Um, that's the only way I can describe it. And what was the confirmation process like for you? It's much different than being nominated as a different judge. You face lots of questions, right? You do. Um, and back then, the, uh, the death penalty um, issues still hadn't been resolved. And so one of the questions people asked me, would I be able to uphold a case where the death penalty um, was in place? Um, my judicial philosophy is I will follow the law wherever it takes me. Uh, sometimes I don't like where the law takes me, and I just bite my lip and, and go through it. Um, we have a check and balance system. The legislature writes the law. We just get to interpret it. Yeah, and this year you became the Chief Justice of the Court, and you're the first African-American Chief Justice of the Connecticut Supreme Court. Um, what did it mean to you when you were offered the job? What do you think it shows about how far we've come in this country? Um, hmm, that's, a, that's a, in many ways, it's a hard question because it was almost overwhelming. Um, I'm, I'm just me, this guy you see here. Uh, and the, the greatness of it all, it's still, it's like a slow moving wave. It's yeah. still coming to me um, about how important this job is, how difficult this job is, and how much people look up to people in this position. Um, I'm just learning all that now, so um, I'm just finding out the impact of me getting into this position. Um, to, to talk to people on a national level and have them congratulate me. Um, I actually have a, a book uh, that, uh, it's the autobiography of Medgar Evers, who was the civil rights uh, activist who was slain um, in 1963 his widow actually signed the inside of the book wow. and wished me well. It, to have that was, it was incredible. So it's an incredible journey. Um, I just don't have the words to put it all in the context yeah. yet. And now, now that you're Chief Justice, you have a, a, a different role and you're leading uh, the rest of the Associate Justices and you're really the face of the court. Um, how's your job changed since you uh, became the Chief Justice? The biggest change is, is the administrative responsibilities. Um, as a justice, I basically focused on the law and, and the case before me. We did have some administrative roles, um, but now I have uh, 3,600 employees, a budget of a half a billion dollars. Um, I've got great people, just fantastic people helping me. Uh, Judge uh, Pat Carroll is, is one of those people, and uh, Judge Bizzuto, um, who is uh, the Deputy Chief Court Administrator. 
Um, they help me run the administrative portion of the branch, as well as other just uh, really, really good people. The whole thing is having good people in the right place to uh, help you do the job. Yeah. Now that you're the Chief Justice, when you come back into this conference room after an oral argument, um, do you are you the person leading the discussion, and how how has that been? Um, we that's a that's a good question. How we do it here, every yeah. state is, it's different. How we do it here is the most junior justice actually starts the conversation, right. and it's a good way to get that person to start talking. Because I can remember when I was the most junior justice, you get intimidated by being you know with these six other people who are incredibly smart and none of them are shrinking violets. They will tell you exactly what they think. So by having the most junior person go first, you have to speak and say what your mind is. You don't have this thing of waiting and seeing what everybody else is doing. Now, we do give you an escape valve. You can say, I'd, I'd rather talk and see what other people have to say too. Yeah. Um, but I, I think I've only used that one once when I was the junior yeah. justice. How long were you the junior justice for? Um, it seemed like forever. <laughs> uh, just as Doria came on, I believe it was about three years after I was here, maybe even closer to four. Um, and he was only junior for a very short time. Uh, <laughs> and so he said he worked harder. Um, uh, so now we have, uh, since that time, uh, Justice Khan, Justice Mullins, and now Justice Ecker. Um, so the court has basically been rebuilt. And uh, uh, Justice Palmer is the last of the Weicker appointments. Yeah. Um, after that, everybody is uh, a Malloy appointment to this yeah. court. Yeah. And um, you've, you've been in this court for um, a few years. A few years now, and you've heard many cases. Um, what are some of the hardest cases that you've heard? You know, every case has its own unique difficulties, and uh, I can't tell you the hardest case. I can tell you the most important case, and and I, I say this um, very carefully. The most important case is the, the case I'm working on. It's always the case that I'm working on. And the reason why I say that is because the litigants want you to be that way. They want you to give that case all the energy, uh, all the concentration you possibly can. And they deserve it. And so that's, that's my philosophy on it. I don't think that if you ask me which one of the cases in these books is the most important case, I don't think I could do that. And when you're making a decision, um, how do you try to remain impartial? Because that's one of the most important things about being a judge. Um, I do a lot of implicit bias training uh, for the judges, and that's a, a bias that you may not know you have. Yeah. Um, I think that actually helps me to stay on an even keel. Um, it helps me to not be biased. Um, so I actually work to try to make the unconscious the conscious. And if I'm liking an attorney, I kind of figure, well, why do I like that attorney's argument? Is it yeah. the argument, or is it uh, their style, or is it the school they went to? All those things can influence your mind. I try to think about those things and, okay, neutralize that, neutralize that, neutralize that. If I feel um, that I don't like an argument, why is that? Is it because I don't like the law in that area? Is that the reason why I'm going to decide this case? And it's like, no, I have to decide this case based on the law. So making all those kind of unconscious things that either make you feel good or bad, I start thinking about those and say, okay, put that aside, put that aside, put that aside, or no, I don't have to put that aside. That's not a bias. That's because I don't like that argument. I don't yeah. think that's Connecticut law. Um, so that's how I do it. Yeah, and you've been a judge for many years now, and I'm sure you know many of the lawyers around, around the state. Um, it, it, is, it, is it hard for you sometimes if you know a lawyer making the argument? No. Um, if it's a, a lawyer, uh, for example, I have a clerk who uh, was a very, very good clerk, and we do socialize together sometimes, yeah. and he appears in front of this court. I recuse myself on his cases um, because it's not just that uh, if I feel that I'm close to him. The question is, would somebody else, would a reasonable person think I should not be on that case? And so I look at it, think about those things, and with that attorney, I decide to recuse myself from all the cases that he argues, because it's only fair. I mean, people have to feel that the system is fair in order for the system to work. Yeah, and the court has um, eight sessions of two to three weeks per year. Uh, how many, wh wh what's your average day like um, when, you're, when it's in session? How many cases are you hearing usually? Uh, usually when we're in session, we hear two cases in the morning. Um, that's usual, but sometimes there's, there's multiple cases or um, in a situation coming up, 
I actually scheduled three cases. Um, one is the uh, the voting case out of Waterbury, and that's going to be a tough case and a big case. Um, and it was a timeliness factor. We have to hear that one before the election. Yeah. So I had to sort of stuff that week. Um, that's going to be a big week for us. Yeah, and um, do you usually come. How long does it usually take um, the court to make a decision? It depends on the case. Yeah. Um, a very complicated case can take months. And the other thing that happens is you have to remember, I'll tell you how the process works. We have oral argument. After oral argument, we come into this room, the conference room, and then we have the preliminary vote. Based on that preliminary vote, let's say there's five justices who wish to affirm and two who wish to reverse. The justice who affirm, I have to pick one of those if I'm not in the majority, I have to pick one of those people to author the case. The dissenting justice will figure out which one of them will alter, will offer, uh, I'm sorry, author the case. After the case has been written, after the, the opinion has been written, what will happen is that will be circulated to the entire panel. The panel or, or the number of people who actually heard that case being argued. Members of the panel can either agree with that version, disagree with that yeah. version, or comment otherwise on that version. Yeah. And then it gets modified, and then modified, and then modified until everybody comes to an agreement as to what the majority will be. The dissent will then start writing, and the dissent will then uh, make its various comments, and that, of course, makes the majority have to comment again. <laughs> and so that's why it takes a long time, because it has to keep yeah. going around until we get a final draft of both the majority and the dissenting opinion. And are you guys, what's the breakdown usually like? Is it usually uh, a deadlock, or is it, um, usually is it uh, over overwhelming majority of cases? It, it, it depends on the case. The justices are independent constitutional officers, and they will always do what they think is legally right. Yeah. Um, what is it, and um, the, right now the court is in session. Um, what's your day like when the court, um, does, you, don't, you don't hear cases? Okay, Bef my old life, when I was an associate justice, yeah. it was... Uh, reading, writing, research. Yeah. Um, my new life is reading, writing, research, administrative <laughs> duties, and things like this, uh, yeah. talking to the press. We're, um, we're, openness is good. Sunshine, sunlight is good. And so we're trying to be as open and transparent as possible, and that's what, why I agreed to do this particular interview. Yeah, and one thing that you've tried to address is the confidence in the judicial system and government as a whole. And over the years, uh, many people have lost trust in government institutions. And why do you think that this has happened, and what do you think needs to be done um, to address this? Part of the problem for the judiciary is it was almost like a black box. You know, people would argue their case, and then a decision would come out, and that was the end of it. Um, things have become a lot more complicated, especially for a judiciary like our judiciary, where not only do we do the cases here, we have um, a lot of other things we have to do, like probation in Connecticut is actually within the judiciary. So we have a lot of non-core functions, and we have our core functions. Um, if we can shed light, if we can be transparent on those things, then I think people are more trusting. If we can explain why we do what we do, for example, a lot of people think that the court should decide things um, in a judge's own idea of the world, a view of the world. That's not what we can do. What we have to do is we have to decide the case based on the arguments and the briefs and what the law is in the state of Connecticut. And sometimes people will not like that decision, um, but that's a decision we have to write. Um, so if we get people to understand that's how the system works, I think then they will be more forgiving of the opinions they don't like. Plus, the thing is, if you don't like a decision because of the way the legal reasoning was, you can vote and change it. Right, that's what the legislature is for. Yeah, in the news um, during a confirmation of a judge, we uh, often hear the phrase a judicial activist, and some um, judges have been accused of having their own agenda on the court and expressing their own personal opinions in a case. Do you think judicial activism is an issue in the country? Um, it, de it depends on how you want to look at it. Um, I think there are many times when the issue isn't judicial activism. The issue is the person just doesn't like the outcome of that particular case. Are there some judges who are judicial activists? Uh, yes, there, there are. Um, but, uh, you know, it's whose ox is being gored is a lot of it. Yeah, and the confirmation process can be brutal for some. We saw it here in Connecticut for uh, Justice McDonald's, and we're, we're seeing it on the national level right now for the United States Supreme Court. 
Um, do you think that the confirmation process has been unfair for some people? This confirmation process is always tough, um, and legislat legislators have to do their job. Um, sometimes it seems like they're doing more than they should. Other times it seems like they're not doing enough. Um, I can't comment on any particular situation. Um, I think the confirmation process is extremely important and very, very necessary. Um, but I think it should be a fair process. Yeah, I'm going to finish up with some personal questions. Um, do you have any hobbies? Yes, I do. Um, the, my main hobby is uh, karate. I, I yeah. do Tung Sudo. Dao. Um, my wife is a sixth degree black belt. She's my instructor. Um, I am a fourth degree black belt, and my son Jonathan is a fourth degree black belt. And one of your questions may be, have I ever competed against him? Yes. Um, I'll tell you, we haven't had to fight. <laughs> um, <laughs> But we did have a competition about two years ago where we both ended up in the finals of um, forms or hyungs. And we uh, tied. <laughs> <laughs> and so there had to be a tiebreaker. And so with the, how with the federation that I was with, how you figure out a tie is you drop the highest score. And whoever has the highest score after that wins. But they dropped the highest score, we were still tied. <laughs> so they dropped the lowest score and he beat me by one-tenth of a point. Uh, and I was so proud of him. Yeah. I was so proud because I put everything I had out there on the floor. I was not going to give this to him. <laughs> he had to take it, yeah. and he did. And he gave me a big hug, and it was one of the best moments of my life. Yeah. Is it harder to do more karate now that you are the Chief Justice? It's a lot harder. I have a lot less time. Um, so the other hobby that I, I have, and I, I have a guitar upstairs in my office, yeah. Um, I play guitar, and it's very relaxing, and uh, I've been learning new ways to play various songs. Um, I've been learning Travis picking, which is sort of an interesting way of playing. Um, but it's a lot of fun, and I'm even thinking about, hey, maybe I'll put a garage band together. <laughs> that should be pretty cool. Yeah, and in your job, you, re you read a lot. You read many cases. Um, do you have any favorite books that you like to read for pleasure? Um, I'm a bit of a geek. You may have figured that out. Um, I, I like sci-fi fantasy. I love Lord of the Rings um, and uh, The Hobbit. Um, I like the, uh, quite frankly, L. Ron Hubbard science fiction work, um, Battlefield Earth, things, things of that nature. Um, the Ill Earth War, uh, sci-fi. Yeah. Any uh, favorite TV shows or movies? Uh, I'm actually afraid to admit that I do have some uh, favorite TV <laughs> shows. I'm, I'm afraid how we'll people make comment. Um, I love Daredevil. Um, one of the reasons why it's on uh, Netflix, I believe. One of the reasons why I love that particular show is a martial artist who I know is the stuntman for the, for that show. Um, he's incredible, uh, incredibly good. Um, but they did a remake of Lost in Space, which I used to watch when I was a kid. Um, I've been watching that, and they changed the characters around. Um, Dr. Smith, who was the evil guy in the old series, is now a woman. And so I love that how they changed the cast and that and added a whole new dimension to it. Um, those are uh, Sherlock Holmes, um, the series, those kinds of shows. But I don't get much time to watch that. Television does a lot of watching me, because by the time I get home, I'm so tired I fall asleep and uh, <laughs> I wake up an hour later. Yeah, and a lot of people sometimes are intimidated as a judge, like, oh, he's a judge, he's uh, like a big superior figure. Um, when you meet people and you tell them they're a judge, um, what do they think? Um, let me do it the other way around. I think when most people that I work with will say, you're not like a judge. Yeah. Um, I grew up in the civil service, and so for me, the people that I work with, they're my coworkers, they're my peers, and I, I like that way. Um, out in the general public, yeah, people meet and say, you know, this is the Chief Justice. And I, I actually kind of shy away from, from yeah. that. Um, it's a wonderful job. It, it really is. Um, but as I told you, I'm still dealing with this wave of s actually figuring out the job and seeing how important it really is. Yeah, yeah and I want to finish up with a very difficult question. Um, sure. Connecticut's really, really well known for its uh, pizza places. Um, and do you have a favorite in the state? Uh, whichever one I'm in. <laughs> um, on. You got to have one. Oh, you got to really put me on the spot like that? That's not right. Uh, Pepe's. Okay. What's your, what's your favorite pizza there? 
Um, that actually varies. Um, sometimes it's the plain cheese, sometimes pepperoni. But lately I've been, you know, margarita, you know, the basil and, and mozzarella. And I like that one. For some reason, I, I'm gravitating towards that one. What's yours? I can ask you a question now. Um, I like Sally's. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's a bit of a place. rivalry there, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good second place pizza for you. Hey, Mr. Chief Justice, I want to thank you for coming on. It was great to have you here. Thanks for having me. Thank you for watching. If you're watching this on YouTube, make sure to check out uh, my website, ravingryan.com. Go give me a follow on uh, Facebook and Twitter. Thank you for watching. Reporting for Raving Ryan, I'm Ryan Anastasio.